Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing adapter protein complexes. Okay, right, so we want to understand how we get this adapter protein to the plasma membrane, how we target it to the plasma membrane, because actually it binds to another protein before it binds to the target protein for endocytosis. So we're now going to discuss that interaction with the target protein, uh, sorry, with this initial protein. Right, okay, so basically, if we think about endocytosis in, uh, let's say, an axon terminal here, okay, so let's say this is an axon terminal, then when we, uh, sorry, when we think about exocytosis in an axon terminal, when we think about releasing synaptic vesicles into, um, when we think about fusing the membrane of the synaptic vesicle with the plasma membrane of the axon terminal, what is going to happen? Well, all of the proteins that are in the membrane of the synaptic vesicle, those are going to go into the plasma membrane. Now, let's draw a bigger picture of this. So, here is our synaptic vesicle, which is docked at the plasma membrane. Now, one of the proteins that is in the synaptic vesicle membrane is a protein known as synaptotagmin. Okay, so here is my picture of synaptotagmin. So this is synaptotagmin. And usually the form of synaptotagmin that is within synaptic vesicles is synaptotagmin 1 slash 2. So there are 19, I think, different isoforms of synaptotagmin. So the one that is specific, well, the two that are specifically uh, in synaptic vesicles is synaptotagmin 1 slash 2. We'll colour this protein in green. We'll outline it in green anyway. Okay. Now, uh, this protein is very important, we know, for the fusion of the membrane of the synaptic vesicle with the presynaptic membrane. So let's say uh, we've induced the fusion to occur, then what's going to happen is this vesicle is going to fully fuse with the plasma membrane. Well, we'll assume it fully fuses. Of course, there is the possibility for kiss and run fusion. So uh, what will happen? Let's say it undergoes full fusion, so it forms the fusion pore initially, and then it's going to undergo full fusion. So here comes our synaptic vesicle membrane into the plasma membrane. Now here still is our synaptotagmin 1 slash 2 protein here. So now, here's the plasma membrane of the cell. We've now got our synaptotagmin 1 slash 2 in the plasma membrane. So this is the cytoplasmic side here. So this is the cytoplasm, and this is the extracellular fluid within the synaptic cleft. So the point is that this uh, portion of the synaptotagmin where we have these two special domains, which are actually the calcium binding domains. So here is C2A and C2B domain. These are the special domains of synaptotagmin. These two domains are still on, or still within the cytoplasm. Okay, now it is these, well, it's specifically the C2B domain of synaptotagmin, which the adapter protein complex 2 is going to bind to. And that's how it gets targeted to the plasma membrane. Okay, so let's turn over the page and draw this. So, if we have the plasma membrane here, then we are going to have these synaptotagmin proteins within uh, the uh, membrane of the cell, okay? And here are these two domains of the synaptotagmin protein, C2A and C2B, and they are both what are known as C2 domains. So they are C2 domains, which is a type of protein domain capable of binding calcium. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is our adapter protein complex, the core domain of our adapter protein complex, is going to bind to C2B. Okay, so let's show this happening. So here is our adapter protein complex here. Okay, and here is, so, so far we've drawn the beta, uh, the beta adapting protein. Okay, here comes the alpha adapting protein. Whoops, gone over the C2 beans name, never mind. And here are these two mu and sigma proteins in the middle. Okay, right, I won't colour that in. Well, actually, I'll colour in. I'll have a go at colouring it in. So here's the mu protein in blue there. In orange, I'll have to do it in a colour that will show up, because otherwise you won't see this. In orange, there's the sigma protein down there. 
okay? In red, here's the alpha protein over here, okay? And in green, here's the beta protein here. And basically, the core domain has bound to the C2B domain of the synaptotagmin, and this is how you get it targeted to the membrane. Now, uh, we also find that there's another molecule important in this interaction, and basically, this is the molecule PIP2, okay? So let me discuss PIP2 with you. PIP2 stands for phosphatidyl inositol, uh, 4 5 bisphosphate. Phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 bisphosphate. Okay? And let me try and um, show you the structure of this molecule because it's something that shows up absolutely everywhere in molecular biology. Um, but it's something that generally people don't actually know what it is. So I want to tell you about what it is. So, if this is the phospholipid bilayer of the cell, let's firstly discuss the structure of a normal phospholipid, and then we'll see how phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate is basically just a modified phospholipid. So, the structure of a phospholipid then. So, a phospholipid has this structure here. Okay. In cartoon form, at least. Okay, so let me talk you through this. These two vertical lines here, which I've now coloured in orange, those represent the uh, fatty acids which we have esterified to the first and second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol backbone of the uh, phospholipid. So fatty acids are also known as long-chain carboxylic acids. Well, long-chain carboxylic acids is their more proper name. It's the name that a chemist would use for them. So it tells you what they actually are. They're just carboxylic acids which have very long hydrocarbon tails. Uh, now, when the fatty acids are esterified to glycerol in this way, they're often known as the hydrophobic tails of the molecule, basically. So these are the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid. Okay, so you have two of these, one bound uh, to the first and the second hydroxyl groups, okay, each. Um, so, sorry, each of the first and the second hydroxyl groups has a fatty acid esterified to it. Okay, and then this molecule uh, horizontal in green, this is glycerol, and this is the backbone of the phospholipid. This is the molecule, uh, really, which we constructed the phospholipid from. Now, glycerol is also more properly called um, propane 1,2,3-triol. This is the chemist's name for glycerol. And although it's a mouthful, um, it's more useful in a way than glycerol because it tells you exactly what this molecule actually is. It's a free carbon molecule where you have an alcohol group of every single one of the carbons, one alcohol group of all three carbons. Okay, so, so far, what have we done? We've got this glycerol molecule. We have taken two free fatty acids, well, two fatty acids, and we've esterified those fatty acids to the first and the second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol molecule. Now, what about the third hydroxyl group? Well, to the third hydroxyl group, we have attached a phosphate group here via a phosphoester link, or more properly, a phosphate ester link. Okay, so this is a phosphate group which we have attached onto uh, the third hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and now the entire thing, this entire molecule here, this is a phospholipid. So this is a phospholipid. And you have a bilayer of them where both of them have their hydrophobic tails pointing into the hydrophobic core and their phosphate heads sticking off to either towards the cytoplasm or to the extracellular fluid. So this is a phospholipid. Okay, and now the phospholipids have an old name. They're also referred to as phosphatidate molecules. So you will also hear phospholipids referred to as phosphatidate molecules. Okay, now, although nowadays it's very, very uncommon to hear anyone call a phospholipid a phosphatidate molecule, it's important when we discuss the structure of the, well, when we discuss the name of these modified phospholipids, because here we use this phosphatidate um, name. So phosphatidyl, 
That basically means a phosphatidate molecule with stuff stuck onto it. Okay, so now let's see the structure of phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And I hope to convince you that basically it's just a modified phospholipid. So here is the normal phospholipid structure. So the two free fatty acids, or not, well, they're not free anymore, two fatty acids are stirified to the first and the second hydroxyl groups of glycerol, and then the phosphate group bound to the third hydroxyl group of glycerol. Then, what you attach on to this phosphatidyl uh, group here is an inositol molecule. Now, inositol is a six-membered carbon ring. Okay, so here comes inositol. Uh, if I were to draw the skeletal structure of inositol, because generally people haven't actually ever studied the chemical structure of inositol, unless you're a chemist. So, inositol, what is it? Let's draw the skeletal formula. So it is this six-membered carbon ring, where every single one of the members of the ring is a carbon. Okay, and all the bonds between the carbons are single bonds. But off every single carbon, you have an alcohol group, a hydroxyl group, like so. So this molecule has incredible rotational symmetry here. It has these four, sorry, six carbons with six hydroxyl groups, one off each carbon. And then you'll notice that the, each carbon now only has three bonds, so the other fourth bond is made up by having a hydrogen coming off every single carbon, but you don't show that in the skeletal structure. So this is the skeletal structure of inositol. So let me denote the inositol ring in blue here. We won't draw the hydroxyl groups coming off because it'll mess up our cartoon. So this is the inositol bit here. So what we now have is phosphatidyl inositol. We have taken our inositol ring, and we have taken one of these hydroxyl groups, and we've formed a phosphoester or phosphate ester link with the remaining hydroxyl group of this phosphate group on the phosphatidate molecule. Okay, and that makes us phosphatidyl inositol. However, we want phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So, what we now need to do is add a few more phosphate groups onto this molecule. So, we need to add phosphate groups onto the fourth and the fifth carbon of the inositol ring. Now, if you were going to label the carbons of this ring, how would you do it? Well, I don't know about you, but I'd call the one that's actually got something attached to it, I'd call that one, okay? And I'd then go round in a circle. So, that's what they did. One is here, two, three, Four, so we want to add a phosphate group onto the fourth one. Five, we want to add a phosphate group onto the fifth one. And then there's six over there. So this now is phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, or PIP2 for short. Okay, and hopefully what you can now see is that this is just a modified phospholipid, and indeed it can be put in the phospholipid by there. You can put this in the phospholipid by there, and it can take the place of a normal phospholipid, because essentially it is a phospholipid, just with a bigger head, okay? And that will stick into the cytoplasm. Right, now this molecule is within the plasma membrane in cells. And it seems to be utterly essential for this interaction between the core domain of this adapter protein complex and the C2B domain of the synaptotagmin 1 slash 2. So this is synaptotagmin 1 slash 2. So if you remove all of the PIP, ooh dear, this isn't fitting in, synaptotagmin 1 slash 2. If you remove all of the PIP2 from the plasma membrane, you find that the core complex, uh, sorry, the core domain of the adapter protein complex doesn't interact with the C2B domain nearly as effectively. So you don't target the uh, adapter protein complex to the plasma membrane of the cell nearly as well as you do if the PIP2 is present. So this seems to be somehow involved in allowing this um, interaction here. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.